How's everybody doing today? Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, writer, and historian. So it is Friday, February 5th, 2021. And some of you have heard me talk about uh, my online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And I want to, um, we're going to run this class in the month of February for African American History Month. So a lot of people have been asking, what am I, what am I going to do for Black History Month? Uh, so we're going to do a preview of the online course here. And it is going to start up uh, Tuesday. February 9th, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's going to run eight consecutive uh, Tuesdays, okay, in eight consecutive Tuesdays in the month of February, uh, well, February and March. Uh, and we deal with thousands of years of history, and we deal with what led up to the transatlantic slave trade happening also, all right? So uh, I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have uh, uh, video clips. Uh, articles, book references, and we deal with thousands of years of history, and we deal with what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place, all right? Uh, when we deal with the transatlantic slave trade, we can't start uh, talking about it in uh, 1441 when the Portuguese go into uh, Mauritania. We can't start uh, talking about it in 1619, uh, even though a lot of people talk about you know, August 20th, 1619 in Virginia. We can't start talking about it there. Uh, we can't start uh, talking about the history with us uh, shackled in, in chains. We have to deal with thousands of years of history leading up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place, okay? And we have the information at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com, africanhistorynetwork.com. So it's right on the home page and uh, just click on register. And as soon as you register for the online course, you can start watching bonus content. Uh, it has the class when I ran it back in 2019. Uh, you can start watching all of that content uh, there. All right. And I'll automatically enroll you into uh, the new course. All right. So. You know, one of the things that we deal with is the fact that uh, African people are the original people of North, Central and South America. And I reference uh, Dr. David M. Hotel, who wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. OK, you've seen me interview him a number of times, Dr. David M. Hotel. Um, and this book deals with uh, 713 footnotes and fairly documents the African presence in this country going back at least uh, 51,700 years ago, all right? So usually when I start presentations and things like this, one of the things I say is, you know, I may say some things that are outside the circumference of your own awareness just because you never heard them before, disagree with them or don't like them, does not mean that they are not true, just means you have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about, all right? Uh, we're gonna post the information here for the online course. So it's regularly $130, it's on sale, uh, $80. You can watch from around the world and you can watch over and over again. We do the class live um, and we do a live chat in the class as well. You can ask questions and then all the sessions are recorded so you can go back and watch it over and over again. So there was a study from the Southern Poverty Law Center and I, I deal with this in some of my lectures. There was a study from the Southern Poverty Law Center uh, a few years ago and it, it dealt with what kids are learning about slavery. A new report finds that the topic is mistaught and often sentimentalized and students are alarmingly misinformed as a result. OK, and this ties into uh, uh, understanding the fight for reparations and uh, a debt owed because most, most most Americans don't think a debt is owed when it comes to reparations because they've been miseducated about the history of this country. Uh, a new report released by the Southern Poverty Law Centers teaching tolerance project points to the widespread failure to accurately teach the hard and nuanced history of American slavery and enslaved people. Collectively, the report finds 
that slavery is mistaught, mischaracterized, sanitized, and sentimentalized, leaving students po poorly educated and contemporary issues of race and racism misunderstood. So when we deal with understanding racism as a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race coming out of the context of European white supremacy, that comes from a, uh, a, a understanding of history, having that foundation, okay? Most Americans have been, most Americans are, are, are woefully ignorant of history because of the educational system. So therefore they are miseducated about the history of slavery, the history, the origins of this country, miseducated when it comes to African-American history as well. This falls into, this ties into policies, policies they support, who they vote for elected office, okay? Uh, and and, and just look at the fight over the Confederate battle flag of Northern Virginia, which many people think is the Confederate flag and is not. There were three flags that flew over the Confederate States of America from 1861 to 1865. That flag that was on top of the General Lee car was not was never one of those flags. OK, look at the fight over the Confederate monuments. Th those are monuments honoring traitors to the Union who committed treason against the Union based upon Article three, Section three of the U.S. Constitution. But because people so many people are ignorant of history and you have this whole movement called the Lost Cause. And the lost cause was dealing with uh, uh, rewriting the history of the Civil War and what the Civil War was about. And you had uh, organizations like the uh, uh, Daughters of the Confederacy financing uh, curriculums and, and financing this movement to rewrite the history of, of uh, the Civil War and, and Reconstruction. Uh, to, to create this whole lost cause movement that the South was fighting for states' rights and they were being, you know, subjected to tyranny by the by the Union, the, the Yankees, things like this. OK. All right. So. Um, there's a there's a study. So I, one of the things I use in the class is a study here from the Southern Poverty Law. And this is just one of the of the tools. Uh, it's about a 56 page study fairly documents how the history of slavery has been in, incorrectly taught uh, in the American schools, and it makes recommendations on how to better teach the history of slavery as well. That's just one of the uh, sources that I use. Okay, let's continue here. Uh, so in what it describes as the first analysis of its kind, teaching tolerance conducted online surveys of 1,000 American high school seniors and more than 1,700 social studies teachers across the country. The group also reviewed 10 commonly used U.S. history books and examined 15 sets of state standards to assess what students know, what educators teach, what publishers include in textbooks, and what standards require vis-a-vis -vis slavery. Among 12th graders, okay, so they did a survey of 1,000 12th graders, okay, 1,000 seniors across the country. They found that only 8% of 12th graders surveyed, only 8% of 12th graders surveyed uh, could identify slavery as the cause or the central cause of the Civil War. Only 8% of high school seniors surveyed. Fewer than one third of high school seniors or only, or only 32% correctly named the 13th Amendment as the formal end of U.S. slavery. It took a constitutional amendment to uh, uh, it took a constitutional amendment to formally end uh, slavery in this country. And then with slightly with a high, a slightly higher share, 35 percent chose the Emancipation Proclamation. The Emancipation Proclamation uh, did not lose, did, did, did not end slavery. The Emancipation Proclamation, January 1st, 1863. And when you read it and you can read the Emancipation Proclamation at archives.gov, uh, the National Archives, or you can read it at um, uh, LOC.gov, Library of Congress, it tells you basically the slaves in the territories of rebellion or the states in rebellion, the states in the Confederacy are free, but those that are in the border states, uh, Missouri, Kentucky, Delaware, things like that, they're still slaves. Those, those territories and states that stayed loyal to the Union were allowed to keep their slaves for a period of time, okay? That, that's not what ended slavery. But do you have people who have these misconceptions, all right? Um, so let's continue here. So we have uh, 
this one here. Now, there was a good article from the Atlantic.com, what kids are really learning about slavery. This is from 2018. And this is when this study came out, February 2018, into January, early February. And uh, this article deals with that study from the Southern Poverty Law Center. Fewer than half or 46 uh, percent of, of high school seniors surveyed identified the Middle Passage as the transport of enslaved Africans across the Atlantic Ocean to North America. So it's, it's showing how little uh, high school seniors know about the history of slavery and their parents probably know very little about the history of slavery as well. Otherwise, they probably probably would have taught their children more. So you're dealing with a deficit. So when we deal with trying to get policies put in place to address our needs and concerns, and we're dealing with historic, we're, we're dealing with conditions that come from a historical context, policies and laws put into place to maldistribute wealth pond resources into the hands of Europeans. When we try to get those issues addressed, we're largely dealing with people who are ignorant to the history of how all this came to be. That's why the study from uh, Citibank, uh, 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 Citibank, uh, or a uh, city group in September of 2020 that dealt with how, um, the U S has lost $16 trillion in 20 years because of racism. Okay. $16 trillion in 20 years because of racism. That's why it's so important because it ties into, uh, it's looking from two, about the year 2000 to 2020, but it's uh, tying into uh, redlining, uh, racism, discrimination, different things like this that have a historical uh, foundation, okay? Uh, there was an article from uh, CBS.com that breaks this down. I did a whole presentation uh, dealing with this. We, we air that here on the, um, on the African History Network. I'm going to uh, flip over to this article here, uh, and this really ties uh, the history into what we see today, okay? This is from CBS.com, CBSnews.com, I should say. Racism has cost the U.S. $16 trillion city group fines. This is from September 23rd, 2020. And one of the things they talk about is America could have been $16 trillion richer if not for inequities in education, housing, wages, and business investment between African-American and white Americans over the past 20 years, new research concludes. Um, Citigroup arrived at this. And so this is, this is the latest of a body of research that attempts to quantify, attempts to quantify the economic impact of systemic racism. All right. We're seeing we're seeing the results of history. We're seeing those results manifest in the racial wealth gap. Citigroup arrived at its 16 trillion dollar figure after estimating that African-American workers, African-American workers have lost one hundred and thirteen billion dollars in potential wages over the past two decades because they could not get a college degree. The housing market lost $218 billion in sales because African-American applicants could not get home loans. About $13 trillion in business revenue never flowed into the economy because African-American entrepreneurs could not access bank loans. What's more, the U.S. could have $5 trillion in gross domestic product over the next five years if those gaps and other and others were closed today, the study indicated. Now, in one of the recent, to tie this into policy, in, in one of the recent uh, executive orders uh, from uh, the Joe Biden administration, they deal with the racial wealth gap and they, they cite that statistic dealing with uh, the $5 trillion. Okay, so when I heard him talk about it, I knew exactly where it came from. It came from, uh, it came from this study, all right? If we look at this here, uh, for instance, if we look at this executive order, all this ties into policy. Politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of law, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. Let's look at this very quickly. We're dealing with a, a legacy of racism, discrimination, redlining, et cetera. We're dealing with laws, and then it, what, what, 
is important to understand is that if it was public policy that put us in this predicament, it's going to be public policy that gets us out of this predicament. I'm all for economic empowerment, but that ain't that's not what put us in here. If you actually understand the history, it was laws and policies that created these inequities. There's going to be laws and policies that correct them. If you look at this executive order from January 20th, 2021, read it. Don't take my word for it. Read the, read, read the executive order. You can read all executive orders from the president at whitehouse.gov. That's where this is from, whitehouse.gov. If you go and uh, this one is uh, executive order on advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities through the federal government. This was on inauguration day, which was a half day of work. He did 10 executive orders on inauguration day. Read this one right here. If you go through for the sake of time, we're going to go through and just get right to what I want to get to. For example, an analysis shows that closing racial gaps in wages, housing credit, lending opportunities, and access to higher education would amount to an additional $5 trillion in gross domestic product in the American economy over the next five years. Okay, That comes directly from that study from Citigroup. That study was done by a sister from Citigroup. But that ties into history and understanding history. Okay, So that's why the study from the Southern Poverty Law Center is so important. That's why the type of information that we provide is so important as well. All this ties into history and it deals with understanding um, the, the legacy of racism, legacy of slavery, et cetera, and all these policies and how they impact us today. One of the things that the study from Citigroup showed is how racism negatively impacts everybody. What this is so uh, see, oftentimes people think, OK, when you look at when you look at the fact that the U.S. economy lost 16 trillion dollars. OK, it wasn't just African-Americans. It's the U.S. economy. Everybody. Is being hurt by racism, even though we get the brunt of it. What this study shows from Citigroup is how racism is actually bad for everybody. But you have some people who are miseducated who buy into thinking it benefits them. But no, it really hurts everybody. OK, so. All right. Um, oh, let me flip back over to the. Uh, one from Citigroup, this one right here. Yeah. OK, so what this what this study from Citigroup is showing is how racism actually hurts everybody, even though African-Americans get the, get the brunt of it. OK, America could have been 16 trillion dollars richer if not for inequities in education, housing, wages and business investment between African-Americans and white Americans. OK, and then it shows how the U.S. economy could grow by five trillion over the next five years if you correct these inequities. How this benefits everybody. But when you have people who are ignorant of history. They don't understand this. All right, let's continue. So I want to go back to the. Um, in the last time I taught this, uh, last time I taught this class in 2019, this study didn't exist. So there's new information that's come out even since the last time I taught this online course. All right, how's everybody doing? So we're just doing a preview of uh, the online course that I teach. And we're kicking it off in African American History Month. It's going to start Tuesday, February 9th. It's going to be 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, eight consecutive weeks. It's called Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, What They Didn't Teach You in School. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, What They Didn't Teach You in School. And uh, this is a uh, eight-week online course that I teach. We deal with thousands of years of history, and we deal with what led up to the transatlantic slave trade uh, happening as well. OK. All right. So very quickly here, if we uh, so as soon as you register, uh, so the class is regularly one hundred thirty dollars is on sale, eighty dollars. You can watch from around the world. As soon as you register, you can watch bonus content from 2019 
when I did this class in 2019. Okay, and then I'll, I'll enroll you into the class starting up uh, Tuesday, uh, February 9th. All right. So uh, I want to show you a couple of things here. If we look at, let's see here. Let's go to. I'm gonna do a, a, a brief overview of some of the things we cover in the class. Um, so we deal with ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, um, and we deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. Uh, we do what was the transatlantic slave trade? What were some of the events that led up to the transatlantic slave trade starting? What role did Christopher Columbus play? Because Columbus is central to the transatlantic slave trade spreading. It didn't start with Columbus, but uh, Columbus and his four voyages starting August 3rd, 1492. Um, Columbus helps to spread slavery and conquer new lands. And this gives new lands for uh, Spain to uh, grow crops, set up, set up sugar cane plantations. And then you're gonna have fights between these European nations over a lot of these new lands that are that are that are being conquered and, and stolen. Uh, when did Africans first come to the U.S. Uh, as slaves? Because we we were here going back tens of thousands of years. So I'm going to show you some information dealing with that. Did Africans sell themselves into slavery? We deal with that complicated history. Uh, were African people in America before the slave trade? Yes, we were. We we were in this land before Native Americans even came into the existence. Now this is not a slight against Native Americans, but you know it's, it's true we were. Uh, the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, because to understand the transatlantic slave trade, you got to understand the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors and what the Moors took into Europe, the technology, the mathematics, the science, the medicine. And they're taking teachings coming from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt into Europe. And this is going to bring Europe out of the dark ages. And then we're going to see all this lead to the transatlantic slave trade happening. And one of the things that's happening in Europe with the African Moors is that the Moors are intermixing into the European population. The Moors are intermixing into the European population. They're having sex with Europeans and is producing a what we would call today biracial people is producing darker complexion people. And we're going to see that we're going to see the Moors changing the complexion of Europeans to various extents in different European countries, especially Spain and Portugal, because that's right above Morocco, Spain and Portugal. And they're going through Morocco largely into Spain and Portugal. Uh, we're going to see it in England and Austria. When you look at England, you look at someone like Queen Charlotte Sophia, Queen Charlotte Sophia, OK, who was the wife of King George III. King George III is the king that the 13 colonies are revolting against during the American Revolutionary War of 1775 to 1783. Queen Charlotte Sophia was of African Morse ancestry on her mother's side of the family. OK, so we're, so you're going to see this. You're going to see this in Austria and Germany, things like this. All right. So. Um, Let's see here. We deal with shocking archaeological discoveries that are causing experts to rethink everything. Because when these archaeological discoveries happen, and there have been a number that have happened since like 2017, the scientists and archaeologists, they say they have to rethink everything. They have to push timelines back. I talk about how they have to back that thing up. Remember the song about juvenile, back that thing up. All right. <laughs> they keep having to back the timelines up when new discoveries come out. Uh, insurance companies, we talk about insurance companies that took out policies on slave ships and enslaved Africans on the plantations, Freemasonry, America and the founding fathers, origins of the term America, Africa, et cetera. We do with all this uh, in the online course and, and, and a lot more because it's, it's uh, eight weeks, eight consecutive weeks. Um, let me show you something uh, quickly here. Let's look at information. OK, so uh, Dr. David M. Hotel wrote the book, The First Americans, where Africans documented evidence. It's out of print right now. His new book should be out very soon. I have to call him again. I interviewed him October 12th and um, I need to see what's going on with his uh, book. But his book deals with. Uh, 713 footnotes and it deals with uh, evidence from 13 different disciplines showing an African presence in the territory we call South Carolina, going back at least 51,700 years ago. Uh, they found artifacts at, at this campsite. Dr. Albert Goodyear 
who's an archaeologist at the University of South Carolina. In 2004, he made this discovery. They found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints, and lava, genetic M174D haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics, linguistics, paintings, skulls, skeleton structures, and tools. 13 different types of disciplines fairly documenting an African presence in this country going back at least 51,700 years ago. These were the Khoisan who come from Southern Africa. And um, they're, um, they're the ancestors to the Ainu and the Twa. They go all around the world and they were in this land, the short statured people, okay, the, 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 uh, uh, the Khoisan. If we, okay, so this is Dr. Albert Goodyear. This is an article from um, ScienceDaily.com, ScienceDaily.com from November 18th, 2004, called New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. And this is a summary of, uh, of the article from ScienceDaily.com. This is their summary. And it says, radiocarbon tests of carbonized plant remains where artifacts were unearthed uh, last May along the Savannah River in Allendale County by University of North Carolina archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least at least 50,000 years old, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age. Now, this is before Native Americans came into existence. Okay, this is before Native Americans came into existence. These were these were the Khoisan. All right. OK, so so you can read this article. You don't have to believe me. Proper documentation ends all conversation. You don't have to believe a word that I say. Uh, I am provide you with numerous sources. You can go research this yourself. Those that watch me and one of my teachers is Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamane. He says, you know, you see him in the Hidden Colors documentaries. We're in the uh, we're in a couple of documentaries together. Also, he says, you don't have to believe a word that I say. Go do your own research. Now, I provide you with the evidence. Proper documentation ends all conversation. All right, so we have this. We deal with archaeological discoveries like this one here. This is from uh, the New York Times, February 15th, 2010. It talks about how on, this is the name of the article on Crete, new evidence of very ancient mariners. And it deals with how on the Greek island of Crete, over the course of two summers, archaeologists, uh, archaeologists found stone tools that date back at least 130,000 years ago, okay? But Crete has been an island for more than five million years, which means they had to sail there. But when you read this, when you read this full article and read this information on this, it says that um, they thought the, 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 the scientists and archaeologists, previous artifact discoveries had shown people reaching Cyprus, a few other Greek islands and possibly Sardinia no earlier than 10,000 or 12,000 years ago. OK, but this discovery Ha, they, they have to push that back tens of thousands of years ago. They have to rethink everything. They have to they have to back that thing up. OK, they say that uh, the, uh, 130,000 years old, which is considered strong evidence for the earliest known seafaring in the Mediterranean and calls for rethinking the maritime capabilities of prehuman cultures. OK, but they, but they, they this wasn't prehuman. These were still these were still uh, homo sapiens sapiens. These are the, you, you're talking about 130,000 years ago. When you go, uh, th there's a discovery in Morocco from about 2017 where they found fossils of modern man. Okay, and these were the and these were Homo sapiens, but it was modern man. They found these and they date back between 300,000 and 350,000 years ago. There's a big discovery in Morocco about uh, June of 2017. Okay. Every other month, these discoveries are coming out. When you look at National Geographic, um, you look at like National Geographic website and other websites, e even Washington Post, New York Times, like in their science sections, they have these discoveries. They, they uh, write about these discoveries that are taking place all the time. OK, so we deal with all different types of things like this in the classroom. We do a timeline to uh, give you a better understanding of what leads to the transatlantic slave trade happening. We deal with um, we deal with the Moors and let me pull this up. We deal with uh, 
uh, the Moors and uh, January 2nd, 1492, when they lose control of the last stronghold in Granada. Uh, we deal with uh, understanding what's known as Egypt and of the West and how the Nile Valley region of Africa, ancient Kemet, especially ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, but the whole Nile Valley, how that influences um, this country. OK, and you look at this, you look at the Tekken. OK, the Washington Monument is a Tekken. We, we look at the origins of Freemasonry, things like this. All this deals with history. We do a chronology of history, bringing you up to the transatlantic slave trade and deal with it. So we can't start studying our history with the transatlantic slave trade. We have to understand Freemasonry is based upon the teachings that the Moors took into Europe. OK, so like uh, one of the sources that I, that I use is uh, from Tony Browder. Tony Browder is a friend of mine, brilliant historian and archeologist. Egypt on the Potomac, pages 18 and 32. The word Mason is derived from the Latin words mass and son. Mason means child of light and expresses the desire to pursue light, which is a metaphor for the sun, which symbolizes knowledge. The term child of light or sons and daughters of light was first used to identify students who had, who had completed 42 years of study in the temples of ancient Kemet. Many Masonic temples were modeled after the temples of Kemet, places where light or knowledge was imparted in a series of steps or degrees. So when you go to college or university and you get your credentials in the form of degrees, this is where this comes from. This is where this comes from. You read um, uh, Stolen Legacy by George G.M. James. He deals with this type of information in Stolen Legacy as well. All right. So uh, if we look at very quickly here, Freemasonry. Did you know that 50 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence and 13 signers of the U.S. Constitution were Freemasons? Did you know that four of the uh, for the first five U.S. presidents were Freemasons, and there have been 14 Freemasons who have been U.S. presidents. If you uh, check out page 18 of Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder, in his book, Egypt on the Potomac deals with how the layout of Washington, D.C. is basically a copy of ancient Egypt. And it deals with Benjamin Banneker and all this. We did the surveying for the layout of uh, Washington, D.C. And I have... Egypt on the Potomac somewhere around here because uh, we have now Valley contributions of civilization right here. These two books right here are excellent. So I use these in the, I use these in the class from uh, Tony Browder, Egypt on the Potomac and now Valley contributions of civilization. Now you don't have to buy any of the books to follow along in the class. If you want to, that's fine, but you don't have to buy any to follow along in the class. Okay. All right. So these are some of the things that we deal with. We deal with, Asar, Aset, and Heru, uh, the first Holy Trinity, or who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. We deal with all this, uh, this, this history and the Immaculate Conception. Heru, born of a virgin birth on December 25th to Aset, Isis. Some of this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness, but this deals with mythology. This ties into culture and history. This is going back thousands of years ago. Um, but you can see that, you know, uh, if you, okay, we ain't going to get deep into this, but these are just some of the things we deal with. We do, we deal with this history and we deal with what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade happening. All right. Lastly, we'll look at, uh, let's see here. So that's a, that's a, that's an overview of some of the things we, uh, deal with in the class. We have to deal with Christopher Columbus. All right. And where Columbus went on his four voyages, when you study where Columbus went on his four voyages. And if you go to history dot com, the official website of the History Channel, it shows you where he went on his four voyages. Columbus never came to the land that we call the United States of America. He never came to the land we call the United States of America. The closest he came here is Cuba, which is 90 miles away. This is where he went on his four voyages. OK, so these are all some of the things that we deal with in the class. It starts up Tuesday. Uh, February 9th, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. So if you go to our website, we're going to post a link here, but also you can go to uh, our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, uh, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, 
you can go to the website and right on the home page is the um we have the information right on the home page and uh, let me bring this up here i'll show it to you and uh we have the information for the online course right on the home page and just click on the link and uh here we go so right at our website africanhistorynetwork.com just scroll down you'll see information about our radio show the african history network show scroll down here and it's taking and uh, just click on register here okay it's going to be tuesday february 9th 8 p.m Eastern standard time and then click right here enroll um it's, it's on sale 80 dollars regularly 130 and as soon as you enroll it you can start watching the content from the class I did in 2019, all right? All that content is archived, those classes. And then I'll automatically enroll you in the new class starting of February 8th, um, 2021. February 9th, 2021, Tuesday, February 9th, 2021. 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and it's gonna be eight consecutive uh, Tuesdays, all right? If you wanna pay through cat, now if you have any questions, email us at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com. AHN show at africanhistorynetwork.com. When you go to the website, it has you pay through your debit card, credit card, or what have you through PayPal. If you want to pay through Cash App, email us and we can set that up also. If you want to pay through Cash App, and uh, here's, the, here's the link also to, uh, um, to the online course as well. Okay. All right. Look, we got to get out of here. Remember, right now is correct, wrong behavior is not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you next time. Peace.